Hello, I'm Carwin Jones and welcome to this series of podcasts where I talk to the movers and shakers in the Welsh economy. What's their background? Uh, What's the type of business they're involved with now and what do they do? And how do they see the future? Where do they see Wales and their particular line of business going in the years to come? I'm joined today by Giles Thorley, who is the Chief Executive of the Development Bank of Wales. Giles, you're very welcome indeed. Borada, good morning. Now, uh, looking at your uh, background, a uh, strong CV, if I can put it that way, but uh, <laughs> where are you from originally? Well, I was born in Afghanistan, uh, lived That's, abroad. <laughs> we've not had that before. <laughs> no, no, no. So there you go. Uh, I was, um, I'm, I was, uh, I lived abroad in pretty much all my life till I was aged 11, then uh, brought up to secondary school in Hereford. So uh, Mid Wales, uh, Powys and Aberystwyth and... Devil's Bridge, Red or Valley, all of that was my playground when I was a kid. Yep. We used to go on scout camps and CCF camps um, all over Wales. Um, hinterland locations mainly. Indeed. <laughs> well, well, indeed. Exactly. Yeah. Hinterland has uh, made it famous again, yes. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm i two quarters Welsh. I have two Welsh grandfathers, one from North Wales and one from uh, South Wales. So for those who think that a banker can't make two quarters into half, I think two quarters is definitely two quarters when they're from different parts of the world. Um and uh, but I um, I then went to university in London and I'm the same age as you in fact uh, Cohen and uh, must have been at the Inns of Court School of Law about the same time as you I think well, I think you're younger than me uh, 67 or ah, well, March 67 well, well, yes. and I'm June 67 so we were I, at the same time I was I was the, you were the, you were the last year of the bar finals I, I believe was, and yeah, I was the I was, first right. year of the BBC because I took yeah, a year right, off yeah. and in that year off I worked for McDonald's including um, shifts at uh, Cumbran Shopping Centre. So I've actually worked at McDonald's in Cumbran. Um, although my main, um, the main McDonald's I worked was was at Oxford and Hereford. So there you go. My first job was pushing trolleys in Tesco's. Well, there you so, go. So. Yeah, that's, that was, uh, got to start somewhere. Um, law degree. Uh, you went to Inzacourt School of Law. Yeah. Uh, did you ever practice? No. Um, f- number of reasons my mother died when I was at university and I really didn't have any financial backing I didn't feel confident enough to uh, to go into uh, barristers chambers and I also had worked in the summers um, in the city doing temp jobs and that gave me uh, a a helpful uh, shoe into the graduate training programs and I ended up going to work in the city in 1990. Yeah, those the, in the days of wide braces and uh, <laughs> has a very different atmosphere in those days, wasn't it? it definitely, yes. <laughs> it was after Big Bang, although oh, yeah. although we had, you know, we had the, there were bumps in the road quite quickly after I joined. So we saw all sorts of things go on in that stage. You became the chief exec of Punch Taverns in December of two thousand one. Eight years there, only nine years, and then a director of Tiwi, uh, two thousand five to twenty eleven. And we go through your CV: chairman of the Tragus Group, operating partner of TDR Capital. Then in April 2016, you become the Chief Executive of Finance Wales. Quite a journey there. What brought you uh, to Wales, back to Wales if I can put it that way, uh, and into the job of the Chief Executive of Finance Wales? What was what was that journey like? Uh, well, there's a couple of points to that. Firstly, I'm, I've surprised myself as much as probably anybody else, but my, my teachers at school, that that I was far more successful, both um, sort of operationally and financially, than I ever expected. And have always thought about doing something slightly different and, and not wanting to be stuck in a, in, a, in a sort of career path going onwards and upwards. Um, and so whilst I've done a lot of jobs and I've you know, had a lot of um, experiences, I also always was very interested in make, finding opportunities to do something different, to put something back. I've been a, chari- a trustee of a sailing charity for almost 20 years now that um, raised lots of money for them. Um, I was shortlisted for the chief executive of Save the Children back in 2006, and I, in many ways I wish I'd done that at the time, but, um, but they went in a slightly different direction. And I think, um, so I've always been, um, uh, and I live in Gloucestershire now, um, commute to Cardiff and to Wrexham on a regular basis, so I wanted to be closer to home and... Um, and I said to a headhunter many years ago, maybe as long as eight, nine years ago, that if there was a financial services job within a one-hour radius of, of Gloucestershire, I'd be really interested. And then out in you know, early two th- mid-2015, I got the call to say, um, what about Cardiff? And since I you know, already have 
quite a lot of affinity with Wales, it was a relatively easy opportunity. And and actually also, I think um, it was sometime before that, the um, when Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for a for a you know microfinance bank, I suddenly thought people elsewhere were realizing the the, the opportunity that um, is presented by by clever finance solutions for economies and um, and I thought that was something that was really interesting the opportunity to create a bank in the UK I mean it's a phenomenal chance it was Grameen wasn't it in Bangladesh yeah, Grameen, yeah, yeah. that's right yeah it's an incredible uh, incredible story there and then, of course, the Development Bank is set up in October 2017. You make that move then to become the uh, the chief exec of the Development Bank. Now, a lot of people will be listening today, and they will have heard of the Development Bank, uh, have some idea of what it does, but really don't know much about the detail. How would you describe the Development Bank and its, uh, its objectives uh, in terms of uh, what it seeks to do? Well... The main so the development bank is targeted at small and medium-sized um, businesses. Uh, the chairman of the business uh, likes to summarise it as micro to medium because we 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 invest between a thousand pounds and five million pounds in in business ventures from sole traders right the way up to some of the most smart tech development companies that um, that Wales has seen. Um, and our job is to fill a gap. So it's, we're not lender of last resort. Um, we are there to make sure that we provide uh, capital where no capital is, el- is provided elsewhere. We provide it on commercial terms. Um, we, uh, it mar- has to be market tested. And yet we find that there's an enormous amount of opportunity there, partly because of the changing risk appetites of the mainstream banks, partly because of the reallocation of capital of the mainstream banks, um, and partly just simply because people no longer want to do a hands-on job of evaluating risk. Um, all of those things have led to a gap in the market that we hope to fill. One of the uh, issues that's long dogged the British economy is the perceived reluctance of British banks over many, many years to invest in uh, growing businesses, which is why it's said that over many years we developed lots of ideas, but they, they were actually uh, manufactured elsewhere because yep. they, there was easier access to finance. Things haven't got any easier since uh, 2007. But how do you uh, stop yourself moving into a situation where you're perceived as a lender of the last resort, not in Bank of England terms, but for a, a business perhaps that's tried everywhere else? It comes to the development bank. It may have legs, it may not have legs. How, how do you make the, the risk assessment as to how to support the business uh, that but maybe can't get finance elsewhere? Yeah, well, I mean, our... our you know, analysis is the same as, as other banks, but our risk appetite is slightly higher. I mean, there, you make a valid point that if we had a very large, you know, we have a finite amount of resource, even though we've grown the business quite substantially over the last two and a half years, we still have a finite amount of capital. So we're never going to be able to solve every problem. Um, and, and God forbid we do have that because that would, would allow others to abrogate their responsibilities. And I, and I do, you know, I do have concerns that 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 um just the uh sort of the the market conditions and the change of the way that banks do their business is is pushing them further and further away from the type of customers that we're looking after the the small and micro-sized businesses another issue that, that that people have mentioned to me is in the days when managers were on the ground in the branches quite often with local businesses managers had better knowledge of those local businesses and were willing to take a that's a slightly bigger risk yep. when it came to providing finance for those businesses. Now that everything is centralised, uh, algorithms rule the day. It's now more difficult, uh, many businesses say to me, to, to, to get a positive answer because everything is there's no flexibility anymore. There's no yep. local knowledge. Yeah, well, interestingly, the, the number one rated uh, business bank in the UK is Handelsbank, a Swedish banking business um, which people, many people won't have heard of. And yet their model is very much about a branch manager having operational and um, uh, autonomy in terms of his their investment decisions, and they make hands-on decisions. Our internal mantra uh, as an organization is best-in-class operations with a human face. So we want to be in a position, and we've, we've made a commitment that we'll be in a position where every customer has a human point of contact. So, um, and in, for the larger businesses, that means very much a hands-on relationship between ourselves and 
the investee companies. The other thing which is different for the development bank is a quarter of what we do is equity investment. So 20, 75% we make is loans, but 25% is, is equity investments. We're investing alongside the entrepreneurs who created the business, alongside other investors you know, who see an opportunity in the growth of that company. And how many businesses uh, have you helped, did you say, since, uh, since it was set up, since the bank was set up in October 2017? Uh, well, we did 420 last year, 370 odd uh, the year before. So we're growing quite rapidly. Um, you know, we'll be around a thousand uh, already. Um, uh, the the level of investments about 80 million in the last year. Um, I said about 25 million pounds of that is uh, was equity. So we've we've um, given that the target uh, set of the business plan was 80 million invested in f- within five years of the launch of the bank. I think we're pretty pleased with that. Still more to do. The the, the bank itself, of course, uh, set up not as part of government, but set up with with with, with assistance from uh, from Welsh government. One of the issues that I used to find when I was in government is you could have nine successes and one failure, and the media would focus on the failure. Now, inevitably, there will be some businesses that you help uh, that won't work out. That's the nature of life, isn't it? Yep. Uh, it, nothing that anyone can do about that. That's that's a natural. Uh, risk of banking i mean for you what what's what sort of success rate would you look at do you do, you do that in terms of you know, well we, we want to make sure that x percent of the businesses we finance are successful is that something that you do or, or do you just look at each business individually um, and, and assess from there we, we don't think of it in terms of a, um, a percentage of, of the businesses that we support but what we what we aspire to is to make sure that we preserve all of the money that we get from the government whether it's the Welsh government from the EU or other um, government sources, and we cover our fees and we make a little bit. Now, given that we're at the very high end or at the ex- extreme end of the risk curve, I think we think that's a particularly um, g- you know, strong aspiration. Now, but within that, as you rightly say, there are um, you know there is a whole variety of businesses. So we have some phenomenal successes where, as investors, we've made um, you know. Working with the management, we've made 8, 10, 20 times the money that we've invested in the business. And there are businesses that fail and we lose all of our money. But even when the businesses fail, we try to differentiate ourselves from um, the high street lenders. We try to be proactive in helping out uh, businesses uh, to making sure that uh, we are uh, you know, pragmatic in the way that we deal with, uh, with the uh, settlement and resolution, and actually, as a result of which, we generally recover more than the than the conventional banks do, who who tend to uh, to you know create more mayhem when they foreclose on a business than they do did when they were investing. Mm. You've been involved in the world of finance for, for for many years. What in what way would you say the development bank model differs uh, from uh, other organisations that you've worked in? Well, we have an incredible group of people who actually genuinely believe that they're doing something for the benefit of the Welsh um, economy. Um, and I, I can say that across almost everybody who works for me. I think it's the, um, it really is one of the best businesses I've ever worked for. My colleagues are, you know, work incredibly hard. Um, and therefore, they're, you know, they're, they are genuinely interested in the outcome. Most of the major banks for the type of business we do, up to five million pounds, you know, there are maybe one, two million pound thresholds where, frankly, the business the business is written by computer program. So you'll have an online banking relationship, you will have an approval process that will go through a computer algorithm, and there will be very little human intervention. You may not even have a human face as the customer. Computer We're, says no. Well, <laughs> very much the, yeah. that's the case, um, and you know when. The other, the other th- thing I think is is that we talked earlier about um, where the decision making powers are devolved to. In the case of the banks, that's moving more centrally. Um, I've run large multi-site uh, operations in the UK, and it's a very easy decision when you're sitting in an office in Burton on Trent in the middle of England to say, oh, "Gosh, do we really want to run pubs in Aberystwyth or in um, Isle of Skye or or in?" Um, where else was it? Oh, um, Skegness. Um, you know, they are a very, very long way away, and we have to employ people to, you know, to schlep out there. Surely that would be easy just to sell off the periphery. And, and if, essentially, that's all the banks are doing. They are consolidating their decision making operations 
first it was in in Swansea and Cardiff. Now, now it's consolidated, then consolidated to Cardiff, then consolidated to Bristol. Next, it'll be consolidated to Birmingham. And bit by bit, bit by bit, the, the, the operations are moving further and further away from the customer. Is the same process happening in Scotland, or is it? Uh, I mean, I know they've got their own banks, but most of them are part of a larger organisation. I, I think you know, having having the Scotland name in the in the um, in the title means that they have a they have a sort of a, a greater moral responsibility. But I don't think it's materially different. Interestingly. Um, the Scottish government is copying the Welsh government model to create an investment bank. Um, they're called the Scottish National Investment Bank. They are going for a much more grandiose model. It's going to take years to set up. We took a view that the most important thing was to get it set up, get uh, the Development Bank of Wales set up on time and on budget, which we did in 18 months as requested by the Welsh government. Get that in. That's good to hear. I mean, you mentioned centralisation of banks. In Northern Ireland, where my wife's from, there are four different types of every banknote. One of the banks first tries to stop printing banknotes now and is using Bank of England notes. But even that banking system is, you know, is run from elsewhere in effect. I mean, Ulster Bank is run by NatWest. And Northern Bank is now owned by Danske Bank, mm-hmm. which actually has its name on the bank. So try and get rid of a Danske Bank £10 sterling note in Cardiff. Uh, good luck with that one. <laughs> but uh, again, even in, in Northern Ireland, which is, and this is part of the peace process, you see that central. It's not, it's not a peculiar to Wales, but it's happening elsewhere as well. Indeed. Yeah. Charles, you've mentioned the uh, work that uh, DBW does, uh, but uh, it's uh, more extensive uh, than I think a lot of people uh, think. They know about the, the lending function. They know about the investment uh, function in terms of equity. You've mentioned that. What else does the bank do? Yes, well, one of the things that we've been conscious, I, I mentioned earlier that um, our objective is to be uh, to find fill the gap. So a couple of years ago, we identified that uh, small house builders were unable to get funding from anywhere. I mean, literally anywhere. And as a consequence of which, they were struggling to with their working capital to build houses in Wales. And these are these these are sustainable developments of you know five to twenty houses in second in in sites around. Uh, all of the local authorities in Wales. So we set up a property fund. That property fund, uh, that first property fund was invested three times over in the first two years. We've now moved that on to a second property fund uh, for residential house building. We have a commercial property fund. We have a fund which is called the Stalled Sites Fund, which is targeting uh, land that has some form of blight or commercial difficulty to develop. We now also have a tourism fund targeting tourist opportunities, particularly focused on, on West Wales. Um, and then the most recent fund that we've developed, which, which we think is going to prove to be one of the most significant developments in the UK market, is a self-build fund, which is a fund working with local authorities to identify land for individuals to build their own homes. Um, and we've, we've, we've systematically broken that process down into, into manageable parts that um, we feel will mean that uh, you know a, an individual who aspires to build his own home can probably save twenty to thirty percent on the cost of buying a new home. So you mentioned the housing fund. You mentioned tourism. Yep. Um, what sort of practical examples can you can you give us of how the um, the fund for tourism works? Well, the challenge with tourism is that um, that uh, tourist assets um, are. Um, take you know have a relatively long payback. They have a very good payback, but it's a very long term payback. So you have to you have to actually structure your finance and your your support in a, in a slightly different way. The other th- the other thing that's, that's worth noting is if if you, if you were looking from a purely valuation basis and you wanted to build a hotel in Pembrokeshire, for example, on a pure valuation basis, it would never pay off. It would be worth less the day after it was built than it cost to build, and that's frankly absurd. Um, so the only way to solve that is to is to have a much more robust investment strategy where you're looking at the overall benefit. Um, the tourism fund works closely with the tourism team at the Welsh Government. Um, it can combine an element of grant alongside loan from the Development Bank. Um, and we've already, I think we've we've already certainly um, one project has come over my desk on the investment committee. But I think there are four or five projects that we've already uh, uh, supported, and we will continue to do so. Let's look at the future. Uh, I often ask guests to try to predict uh, where we'll be in a decade in their in their line of business. If we were sitting here in ten years' time, where, where would you like the development bank to have, to have to, to go and and have achieved in that time? 
I think um, we talked earlier that um, the inve getting investment monies uh, for entrepreneurs and startups and and mid stage investment businesses is very hard. It takes a huge amount of of time and effort. And I want to be I want the development bank to be in a position to be regarded as as the place with the most straightforward, most accessible capital in the UK. So that if at least as good as anywhere else in the UK, if you want to set up your or develop your business, you're as good to choose Wales as you are to choose anywhere else because we'll make a decision quickly, we will clear and we will continue to support the business. Um, and I don't think we're very far from that, to be honest. Um, we're, we're top four equity investor in the UK already. Two of the top four are both uh, crowd funders. That's a, you know, that's a, a, a computer driven model. So we, 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 Buy with Scotland, uh, Scottish Enterprises are the two biggest equity investors, active equity investors in the UK by number of deals. Um, and I think that um, you know that will make a huge difference for the businesses existing in Wales and also businesses that will, would want to come and relocate to Wales. We've uh, talked about um, DBW, talked about yourself. Let's talk about Wales. Uh, again, over the next 10 years and beyond, where would you like to see Wales go in terms of its uh, economy? Where are the opportunities? Uh, where are the areas where we could uh, make a difference in terms of providing good, high-quality jobs for people? I think a number of people have, have talked about uh, ident finding an identifiable purpose for Wales as a, as a, as a country. And, and I think there are some, some good uh, pointers that um, f firstly, in the current uh, econ uh, political malaise, I think the Welsh government could could genuinely do a you know significant amount to seize the day, and uh, and, and get on with things that is just simply not happening out, out of Westminster. But for example, um, the uh, energy sector. So there are there are everywhere I look in uh, in our portfolio, there are interesting energy projects. So we're backing a business um, that is looking at wave power in in, um, in Pembrokeshire. Um, I th we've, we have a, uh, a small uh, re local energy fund that's, that supports individual wind turbines and solar arrays. Um, and I think there are, there's much more we could do there. I think so, you know, why not Wales become the green capital of, um, of the UK and actually be the net exporter of energy? So whether that's wave energy, whether that's tidal energy, whether that is um, wind power, solar... And, and even you know, looking at the projects like the the conversion of the power station in in um, in Newport to uh, to burning um, rubbish uh, plastic, again, uh, and and I think the the Welsh government's pragmatic view on our nuclear power for for Wilver is 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 going to be an essential part of the overall matrix that we need for a future um, our energy needs in the UK. So there's there's a, there's a simple example, I think. The other thing that we 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 oft forget is that um, millennials are looking for a different lifestyle to to maybe the things that we were looking for. Those of more mature years. <laughs> yep. no, and you know, one of the, so I, I'm a, I'm also a, a, an angel investor, and I've encouraged a couple of businesses that I've invested in to consider Wales as as a base. One in particular, a company called Incopro. Uh, you know, they were growing rapidly in London. The business was constantly having to look for new offices at great expense. I think they've moved four times since since um, uh, they they were founded. They actually need, what their model requires them to have a large number of, in, of uh, you know highly um, intelligent young people to do uh, analysis and research. Um, so um, what we need is a is a is a ready pool of graduates. So initially, I convinced them to set up a satellite office. It started in Kefili. Um, we immediately, we virtually ran out of space as soon as we opened the office, and actually, more recently, convinced them to to look further. And their main operational office is now here in the Hayes in Cardiff. Um, it's the old Burger and Lobster, uh, it's the old fish market, as most people, some will remember, or Habitat for those who remember <laughs> yes, the interim. Was, yeah. um, we've now got a, you know fully operational team. Uh, we're targeting graduates coming out of the South Wales universities. Um, at DBW, we we target, um, you know, we target graduates. We've got uh, eight graduates working for us on the graduate program, um, and it's because great place to live. Housing is considerably cheaper. Quality of life. You're one hour to Clangennet. You can go surfing. You're one hour to um, uh, up Penny Van 
if you want to go mountain climbing, you know, you really haven't got uh, you haven't got a better place in the UK to get out to the countryside, but also to experience the benefits of the city. The Millennium Centre, Welsh National Opera, great uh, shows, amazing um, rock concerts. You know, you have everything in a very um, incredible sporting facilities. Well, I don't think I can add much to that in terms of the way that you've uh, you've sold Wales. I get the impression that we have a more entrepreneurial younger generation than than we've previously had. Access to capital is is an issue for them, of course, but I, I just detect that there's far more confidence uh, generally amongst the younger population and, and a far more of a willingness, perhaps, to to look at self employment and business as a, as a viable option for them. I th- yes, I think the um, sort of the internet, uh, the internet of things, and and um, the, the the whole market of influence, etc., has has highlighted to that generation in particular that there are ways of making money that we have we never even un- we don't even understand, let alone <laughs> even thought of. Yes. Um, and so they're very much more willing to 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 try it out. On the downside, is there is a unfortunately there is a get rich quick mentality. In some cases, and I think people don't realise that it takes considerably longer than they ever expect to actually to, to make a make their return. But I mean, but as you rightly say, I think they are willing to try. Um, and at my time, when I came out of university, but first I was incredibly risk averse. We had interest rates at fifteen percent. We were, you know, we you know, where were you ever going to get? There was you know very high unemployment. The first priority was to get a job and to sort of get stable, get to, get to a stable career path. I don't think people think like that uh, uh, these days. Yes, you and I then had the same experience. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our careers advice in school revolved around the fact that there were effectively five degrees worth doing, and there were medicine, pharmacy, uh, accountancy, law, and dentistry. There were there were the five that yeah. I remember being told that, and hey ho, the two of us became, uh, did law degrees. But I think you're right. In the, in the eighties, particularly, there was a strong bias against going into business. It was seen as too risky. Yeah. You know, the objective was we'd come through you know, five years previously a really difficult economic time uh, in South Wales. It was all about get a job that's steady, well paid, respected with a pension. There's there's a um, a piece of research which was done by I think it was one of the um, uh, one of the consulting firms back in 2006. It was first brought out called Shift Happens, and you can get the Shift Happens videos um, and um, slideshows on on uh, YouTube. But and and what what they are good. I mean, they've been updated, you know, annually ever since. But what they're good at is highlighting how ignorant, in a, in, a, in the nicest possible sense, we become when you sit in a in a certain process. So I, I used to do careers advice at my kids' school, and I would be the person who would go there and sort of the general businessman because I've had four or five careers, depending on, on what you count, and the you know genuinely very different. They've evolved, but they're they're, they're very different. Each one's been very different. And yet all the other presentations were the accountant, the chartered surveyor, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the solicitor, the barrister. Um, and I was, saying to, I was saying to people, look, by all means go to those presentations. But I know doctors who now work as, as business people. I'm a barrister and I know work as a business person. You know, back in, in, in our day, you were expected to do maybe one or two jobs in your lifetime. Now I've done five. Now it's maybe 20 are you going to change a lot of times? So get the right foundations, but be open-minded and be uh, and, and you be willing to try all sorts of things. And the other thing, which the other stat which I always love is that six of the ten jobs are most in demand in the market at the moment didn't exist ten years ago. So that suggests that the things that we're thinking about now, you know, that are, in ten years' time, there'll be a completely different group of jobs that we haven't even thought about yet. And what is the future for Giles Thorley? What uh, what are your personal goals? Do you see over the next decade? Um, well, I, so I genuinely think this is one of the best jobs that I've ever done. I'm, you know, I I still got plenty of, of things to achieve in that time. Um, uh, in the time, I think that um, I'm really, you know, one of the things that's uh, struck me about uh, the, um, uh, you know, my coming to Wales as I've done. It feels all. I feel almost like a, a, a born again Christian. In other words, I feel sort of slightly more passionate about the success of Wales than than, some, than many people who who who've, have lived through the the evolution. But I remember what, coming to Cardiff as a kid and looking at Cardiff now as phenomenal, phenomenal improvement. Probably the best urban renewal in the UK. 
Uh, and I and I what I would, would uh, hope to see is that the um, the Welsh government sees the opportunity of the current malaise in Westminster. That, that malaise isn't going to end on um, in October. It's not going to end in the in the foreseeable future. And actually get on and make a difference by by tackling some of the the the, the big issues in the economy immediately. And I think that will be the biggest thing that differentiate. I hope I'll be part of of, of assisting in some of that uh, process. Charles Thorley, Chief Executive of the Development Bank of Wales. It's been a great pleasure to uh, have had you on the uh, podcast. Best of luck uh, for the future. Thank you. And thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.